It was as functional as a surgeon's knife. Its real beauty lay in its performance. The B-17 was the prime weapon of the United States 8th Air Force in World War II. The 8th Air Force had been created for a single purpose, the precision bombing of strategic targets in the European theater in the full light of day. The theory was that the bombers would be able to penetrate far into enemy territory, overwhelming his air defenses and destroying his ability to wage war by leveling his armament factories without suffering critical losses. That was the theory of strategic bombing. In practice, it was not so simple. Trapped in the belly turret, one gunner. Some lived, some died. It was understood. They were a bunch of boys not long out of high school. They were not heroes. They used what they had to do what they could. This is their story. My dear little sister, in a way, I'm glad I didn't get a chance to see your little home before I left, for it serves as a symbol something small and wonderful to protect and fight for. I have all the faith and confidence in the world that I'll be back. Until then, all my love, from somewhere in England, Harold. The sky keeps no memories. What is written there vanishes like vapor. What was once written there was an epic. This is the battleground of the United States 8th Air Force in World War II. A field of honor. In 1943, America was assembling the greatest air armada ever launched and ever likely to be. Its purpose was to destroy as soon as possible the industrial power of Nazi Germany. The 8th Air Force was based in England on what had been prime farmland. There were more than 130 fields crammed into an area one-third the size of Vermont. The area was called East Anglia. The farmers plowed, sowed, and harvested on the fields that were left, practicing peace next to the engines of war. Many of the Pilgrim Fathers had come from this part of England. Now, some of their descendants had come to help redeem it. It was not that they were super patriots, but they knew where they came from. They valued it. They were ready to defend it. On the night before a mission, the pressure was unremitting. It took all the devotion the ground crews had to keep the squadrons flying. The aircraft were taking enormous punishment, and there were too few. It seemed sometimes in the red hours of the dusk that the 8th Air Force 
was bleeding to death. They had died over places called Willemshaven, Regensburg, and Schweinfurt, especially over Schweinfurt. A letter from Harold Henslin, pilot from Wisconsin, age 21. Dear Mom and Dad, I'm riding from the officers' club tonight. It's getting deserted. That usually means a busy day tomorrow. But there's a warm fire and nice music on the radio. Makes me a little homesick, I guess. Love. October 14th, 1943, was going to be a busy day and a bad one. The target was the ball bearing plants at Schweinfurt. Destroy them and you stop the Nazi war machine cold. The Germans knew that too, so they made Schweinfurt a death trap. October 14th, 1943, those caught up in it would never forget it. We had our usual rancid bacon, peanut butter bread, and coffee. But even in the mess hall, everyone was wondering, is it going to be a big one? Until the briefing, the target was anybody's guess. An easy one, a milk run. Or the other kind, the frightening kind. Today, October 14th, 1943, it was not the easy kind. It was Schweinfurt. They were told what the weather would be, where the anti-aircraft batteries were, when the German fighters might attack. They listened closely. They were professionals. Our CO would then deliver his little pep talk to us, and it was a very straightforward, very military sort of thing. His adjutant would add a few uh, cheery words which I think were the usual ritual. He would say, good luck, good hunting, and goodbye. Everyone knew when you went to a place like Schweinfurt, you were going to, uh, you were going to really be in for a rough day. Rough days were not always the enemy's fault. Sometimes it was the weather. The weather in England was a bad joke capricious, unfriendly, a hazard. And it always caused delays. It gave fear a chance to build up. It tensed the muscles and gnawed at the mind. The weather made them sit. It gave them time to consider the odds. Roger Freeman, historian. In the early days, 8th Air Force bomber crews had a one in three chance of surviving their 25 missions. You never knew when the call was going to come, when the mission alert was on, and in a few hours, you'd be out there with a one in three ch chance of coming back alive. Quite something to live with. I've heard it said that the life expectancy of air crew along about that period was about six to eight missions. And if you got past that, you were kind of making it on barred time. I was the only guy walking the road to the, to the mess hall, and, and I really did talk to the man, and I said, I don't think I can make this, you know? And, and I know I've heard a voice, and you don't have to believe me, but it, the voice was, Carl, don't be afraid, because I'm with you always, even till, till the end of time. That made me go, man. I said, I don't have to worry. I'm protected. And that's strange, but that's, that's what did it. It takes an awful lot of courage to do something if you're terrified. And we had a fellow who really and truly hated airplanes, and he was a pilot. Before every mission, he would go out and quietly uh, throw up in the hard stand out behind the airplane. Anyway, he, he always went, and he flew very well. A dreadful 
dreadful sort of noise come down the chimneys. That's how we knew it was all happening. I think the first few raids, we stood on the doorstep and we used to count the planes out and count the planes back, which was, you know, quite something. The noise was something terrible. One after the other, I, I could never, used to try and count them, but I never did. And then, then after they'd gone peace and quiet, that was only, that was only quiet time of the day we had here. Every plane, ten men waited and sweated it out, watching for the takeoff flare. I was more frightened of takeoffs than anything else. I, I had seen a crew that took off uh, with a load of bombs and, and uh, they didn't make it. And they had 24 missions in, they had one more to go and uh, they were kill, all killed. When you did get in that B-17, heavily loaded as it was, and you started walking those throttles forward, the momentum pressed you back into your seat and you just kept moving those throttles against the wall and the old bird would slowly gain <laughs> momentum and she started building speed and you kept waiting for just a, a little bit of indication that she was ready to fly. And when she finally did uh, take off and clear of the brush at the end of the runway, uh, you knew it was, um, you'd had some real excitement. And we'd be just there watching our own particular aircraft and making sure the old girl got down the runway and got in the air. Perhaps the riskiest part of any mission is to take off in a whole group through a dense cloud without any notion of where other planes might be. So there is always the danger of collision. The sun would be coming through and, and you could start seeing aircraft popping up out of the clouds. But there were so many popping out because there are bases all over East Anglia that uh, you wondered which one was yours that you were supposed to tie in with. The deeper inside Germany the target, the more defenses the 8th had to penetrate. Such raids were very costly, but such targets had to be attacked. The force headed for Schweinfurt that day totaled 291 B-17s. Flying over the channel, if it was a clear day, the atmosphere was such that we would make these long, long contrails and could be seen from 100 miles away. The Germans didn't have any problem spotting us. So you could see this bomber stream heading into target area Germany. Americans were thought to be big talkers, little doers, and there was a certain amount of resentment. But it changed rapidly because anyone who was near one of these airfields soon realized that these guys bled just as readily as our blokes did, and that they could fight, and that they really put their all into it. And you began to hear people who at first possibly were a little hostile suddenly talking about our boys. And they didn't mean British boys, they meant the American boys on the local base. October 14th, 1943, en route Schweinfurt. It was an article of faith in the 8th Air Force that B-17s could defend themselves by flying in a combat box in which their many guns provided shields of fire. 
It was not easy to maintain station. The turbulence buffeted the planes. There was always a danger of collision. At that altitude, the physical anguish was almost as bad as the fear. You know, it's very cold, maybe 60, 70 below zero. And you have to keep reaching up and squeezing that tube from your oxygen mask because the moisture in your breath will condense it, freezes up, and stops the mask up. And we had one man that day that uh, didn't get that done, and he died of anoxia. In the fall of 1943, the fighters could escort the bombers to just beyond the German border. After that, the bombers were on their own. Low on gas, the fighters headed home. They had done what they could. It seemed that no sooner when the tail of our friendly fighter escort was still visible going home, and here comes the nose of the Luftwaffe. The B-17s were alone, and hundreds of German fighters were between them and Schweinfurt. When you see a B-17 start circling down with smoke coming out of its engines, you know that it's not a game anymore, that there's some death going on there. I had a new man on my wing, and he, I told him to be sure and try to do everything I did. And of course, this young man couldn't do what I did because I did it so fast, and he got hit, and he was just a burning. I, try, uh, I tried to tell him, get out of here, get out of here, bail out. You, you can't say there anything. There's, you know, you can't, there's radio silence. You can't talk. And you try to motion to him, go away. I was trying, and the co-pilot was looking at me, and they were flying right beside me still. And I, I finally, they did peel off, and I never did know what happened to them. They never made it back. I imagine they crashed. It was just blazing away, you know. But then I had lost my, I, another one of my fellows. I really didn't even get to know him, because it was his first mission with me. And he, here he was. He, he got killed. They were five miles high, and they had no place to hide. They still had two hours to go to reach their target. So far, 30 of them had been shot out of the sky. 300 men. The German flank batteries were massed around Schweinfurt. They fill the sky with jagged metal. Flak is, I guess, probably the roughest part of a bombing mission. You can't shoot back at it. You can't do anything about it. All you can do is fly through it. If you weren't hit, you, you, you felt the concussion of the, the vacuum where the shell exploded, and then the airplanes would buff it along through that. The run into the target was called the bomb run. It was the time of maximum danger. They had to fly straight and level for 20 to 50 miles. They were sitting ducks. Now, we, we've been turned back by weather, but no 8th Air Force was ever turned back due to enemy action. It was... Uh... Incredible what some of these people did. We never retreated. Once we were committed to a mission, that's one thing we never did was retreat. I mean, there was no such thing as retreat. They had fought their way to the target. They had hit it with all the force they had as accurately as they could. But whether they had been able to prove the theory of strategic bombing was still an open question. They had already suffered critical losses. 30 more B-17s went down over the target and on the way home. 
300 more young men. It was a bloody shambles. I, the way back from Schweinfurt is a, a nightmare vision, which I think all of us who were on that mission still carry with us. Dear Dad, I still consider my army life good fortune no matter what happens. I'm the same fellow you always knew, only a little stronger in my personal convictions. And after being guided through a few recent experiences, I'm inclined to believe that God wants me to return to you again here on Earth. With all my love, your son. about the 17, no matter how they got shot up, that they, they made it back. We knew so many of these boys. They were just boys, you see, when they were here. They were probably 19, 20, you know, early 20s. And um, we did feel very sad when we knew so many planes had not come back. Sixty planes had been lost, 600 men, nearly 20% of those who had set out. Many of the planes that did come back would never fly again. For what had been achieved, the losses seemed unacceptable. In theory, at least, Mission 115 to Schweinfurt had failed. Colonel Milton, who had led the raid on Schweinfurt, reported to the commanding general. I simply described the, uh, the mission from start to finish, uh, what had gone on, what, uh, what we had done. And uh, while I didn't say so, my own view, uh, and that of a lot of us, I guess, was that daylight bombing was becoming a, a pretty hazardous profession, uh, unescorted on deep penetrations. The mood in headquarters might have been desperate after Schweinfurt. They might have realized then that grand strategic bombing was not quite the neat way of the surgical method to be used to end a war. But that was their worry. It wasn't ours. Our prime worry was to get up, do the job, and get back. And to do that, 25 times, if possible, survive and go home. Winter 1943. The future of strategic bombing hung in the balance. After Schweinfurt, it was clear that B-17s alone could not range freely over Germany without fighter escorts. The escorts they had fought well. They just could not fly far enough. It would happen every mission, every day. They died from in-air collisions in the English fog. They died from bullets, from flak, from breathing fire. They kept trying. They kept dying. When you lost some of your friends, you didn't think about it. If you did, uh, uh, I, I think 
it, 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 emotionally you'd get it would affect your own performance so I think we all came into the combat area with the thought we're going to survive but those of us who don't it's the falling of the cards He'd cry so much sometimes, but I'd always try to go someplace where somebody wasn't uh, around uh, and weep for my friends and my crew members that were killed. And uh, it, it started taking its toll on people. You know, you'd, uh, sometimes you'd be cursing God and praying to him at the same time. It was part of the paradox. The long, safe days of the country life and the instant, sharp brutality of war. It was no wonder that some of them celebrated their survival by letting off steam. They just lived for the day. They sort of crammed into one day if it was going to be their last day. There was one thing that could always soothe them, that affirmed that life could still be sweet. And the London women were at your feet. You could dance with anyone you wanted. You couldn't always take them home, but you could dance with them. They had more money. Now, if you went out with a, an English uh, soldier, you got um, fish and chips, you know, but um, you went out with American, you got a taxi ride and um, dinner. <laughs> One place you could find comfort was in the quiet of a little London club. In the back of your mind, you were saying, well, this isn't really real. That the real world is up there in the sky. And the real world is seeing those dreadful burning planes on the ground and seeing cities go up in flame. So you were never quite sure whether that was the nightmare and the Brevet Club was real or whether the Brevet Club was a, a reverie and the, the war was real. By now, America's war effort was in high gear. New bombers, though no long-range escorts as yet, and new men to fly them young and confident, until they met the veterans, the ones who had smelled the flames. They'd sort of walk around like zombies. We were, we were replacements for the, the ones that were shot down. But the re remaining guys were really bad. Yeah. And uh, you'd talk to them, and if they had six missions in, you'd say, God, you're a hero. You know, you can't do that. How can you live? How can you be, still be here? I can't remember the fellow's name. But uh, he wasn't very encouraging. He says, don't unpack your locker bag, he says. He says, they'll be sending it home to your mama soon. It might have been a miracle. It might have been a superior performance. It might have been the luck of the draw. But some guys did make it to 25 missions. And that felt pretty good. As good as if they'd suddenly become immortal. January 1944. Things were going to be different. The long-range escorts were here. They could take the B-17s right to their targets. In six days in February of 1944, 3,800 planes bombed enemy targets. They called it the Big Week. The new P-51s, the Mustangs, sought other targets once the bombers were headed home. No place in Northwest Europe was safe from them. The P-51 
51 was the pawn that changed the game. It made long-range penetration a reality. It laid all of Germany's industries open to daylight attack. My dear sister, I thought I might get home by spring. However, things have changed, and I've been thinking of going into a fighter group when I finish here. P-38s or P-51s. This war business is about all I know, so I guess I might as well go all the way. Don't say anything to Mom and Dad yet. I don't want them to worry. Love, Paro. Gentlemen, the target for today is Berlin. 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 the briefing room and the curtain is down of course the guy gets up and he says the target for today is berlin and everybody ah but i think secretly we really wanted to go because uh, you know that's an important place and here we are we're gonna go to berlin we're gonna do it and we're gonna be the first i know everybody was scared if he says he wasn't scared he wasn't there for Bob Jones, it would be a day he would always remember. There have been other big ones like Ray and Bernie Schweinfurt, but Berlin had a name all by itself, of course. And uh, we went to briefing like any other day. Uh, went to our airplanes like any other day. March 6, 1944. It was a day that began in glory. One Englishman saw what it meant. He thought, there go Texas and Illinois and Oklahoma, Arkansas and Vermont, Maine and Florida and Oregon. It was just a beautiful flight until the world started to come apart. March 6, 1944. Preparations for the invasion of Europe were underway. The 8th Air Force was on the offensive. Berlin. It was a maximum effort. 810 heavy bombers with 800 fighters as escorts. There and back. The bomber's stream was over 90 miles long, a mile wide, and half a mile deep. It took nearly half an hour for the stream to fly over a fixed point. It was formidable, but it was not invulnerable. The fighter escorts could not cover every group in all of the 90-mile stream all of the time. There were gaps in the armor. All the way into the target, in Belgium and Holland and Denmark and in Germany itself, the Messerschmitts and the Fockewolfs scrambled. They would be looking for a gap in the fighter cover, somewhere in the 90 miles of American bombers. And they would find it. Halfway down the bomber stream, there was a problem for Bob Jones's bomber group. Someplace towards Germany, one of the crew suddenly piped up and wanted to know if anybody had seen any of our fighter protection lately. We had not. It hadn't really occurred to us, but we had not. Something was wrong. And it wasn't very long before we could see 
through our windshield that uh, what was wrong was coming. It was German fighters. Two, we thought about two or three hundred of them at the time, like a swarm of bees coming out of the distance. And uh, they went through us just like a cloud went by us. And when it went by, uh, the first time, why our entire high squadron, nine airplanes, was gone. We just took them right out. Raided us a total of three times, and by the time the third raid was over, we found ourselves sitting alone. Elsewhere in the bomber stream, other B-17s were under heavy attack. As they turned into us, and of course they were head-on attacks, and you could see them blinking, the blinking of those 30 millimeters coming at you. But they were so rapid that uh, if you were hit, one moment you were flying without any damage, the next moment you were in trouble. The flak over Berlin was the kind they said was so thick you could walk on it. That's about the time we picked up our third hit. It put a terrific hole in the, in the top turn gunner, and he died right there on the spot. So we were flying with engine and rudder, is all we had left. And it's a kind of a dying swan sort of a thing. Uh, there's no way you're going to recover. You're going down, you know it, but you're giving the people a chance to get out. The uh, other waste gunner was thrown against the tailwheel strut, and I was thrown against him. The plane went into a dive, and uh, I can remember him screaming in my ear, and, and I could feel his head just crushing underneath my, you know, my weight and that plane in that dive. I started to jump, I looked back and saw the radio operator laying on the floor of the radio room with his right leg all bloody. And his eyes were about the size of saucers and black as coal and... Uh, went back and got his chute and got it on him and got him to the waste door. There's nothing going past that door but just fire. And he kind of locked up on the door and I had to jerk him loose from that throw him out the door so I could get out. So when I drop through that Bombay opening, you just can't believe the quietness out, and yet you see all this activity going. Airplanes and uh, bomb bursts, and uh, you see planes going down, and I could see my plane slowly spiraling towards the ground with this long stream of flame coming out of it, and of course you you hope and pray that every one of your members got out. This day, the theory of daylight strategic bombing was vindicated. Berlin was successfully attacked. The losses of the 8th Air Force had been acceptable. They were less than 10%. It occurred to a number of us that day that it must be very demoralizing to Germany to, to see that kind of force over Berlin itself. turning off the target at Berlin, looking back, this armada that seemed to stretch right over the horizon. I don't think anyone will ever see anything like that again. Does your mouth or know your eyes, Cecilia? Does she know that I'm about to steal you? My own One of the first things that we'd do after we was out of uh, danger, that uh, someone would pop up and say, hey, Mick, sing a song, or hey, Bob, sing a song, or how about tracking a jug here or that. It kept us alive, you know, it, uh, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Everybody enjoyed it. Bob Jones began to worry about the rest of his bomber group. When you're flying home, and the combat's over, then the things start to occur to you that uh, there's a lot of airplanes missing someplace, you wonder where they are. And hope, you hope that they just got scattered and will turn up. But uh, when you get close to home, you know. And 
you're all alone going to your base, you know that there's something wrong because there's nobody else around you on your way. And when you come into the field and circle around the rate of land, you can see a lot of empty parking spaces. We landed and taxied to our assigned parking place and were immediately met by our squadron commander who wanted to know what had happened. How do you tell him what's happened? How do you know what's happened other than there are no other aircraft around and the crews didn't come back? He started to cry. And when he started to cry, I guess we all started to cry. It was a shocking moment to realize that you, you alone, had come back and all the others had not. The March 6th raid on Berlin had cost 69 heavy bombers and 11 fighters, 701 young men. It was the worst total of any raid in the war. Yet the figures represented only a 6% loss. That was acceptable, so far as the theory went. My dear family, I'm tired tonight. I put in a very heavy day, spending over 10 hours in my home in the sky. I was just thinking, I could almost fly home from here in that amount of time. But things are looking better over here, so don't worry about me. All my love, Harold. The Secretary of War desires me to express his deep regret that your son, First Lieutenant Harold F. Henslin, has been reported killed in action April 28th, over France. Lieutenant Henslin would now be 62. It was his 21st mission. Three of his crew survived. Twenty-six thousand men of the 8th Air Force died on active service, all of them far too young. Seventeen men won the Medal of Honor, 7,000 the Purple Heart, but they won much more than that. They won generations of peace in Europe. Children not yet born will be their debtors. They themselves, of course, had different reasons for doing what they did. Flying an airplane was, to us 20-year-olds, a, let's face it, kind of a romantic thing to do. It was new and different. It was glamour. I had to fly. It just never entered our minds that um, we wouldn't fly. We were trained to do it. We believed in the mission that we were on, that uh, Hitler had to be stopped. I couldn't refuse to fly. I, I couldn't do it. I mean, you know, they were like brothers to me. My crew, didn't any of them not go? I mean, I'm gonna do what they do, you know? I was scared. Everybody was scared. We were doing our job. We were being part of our, the times in which we lived. We were assigned to a particular moment in that time, and we were trying to fulfill it. I don't think that I can cast it more heroically as much as I'd like to.
NBC News produced this program and is responsible for its content.